So well, thank you very much, Alex, for the for the intro and also for the for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to present uh, my work here today on how tissues orchestrate growth and and morphogenesis. So, <clears throat> to like to build uh, functional organs, embryos they need to generate all the different uh, types of cells in the right number because this will determine the size um, of the organs, right? Which is of course important for function. But not only that, all these cells, they need to be spatially organized into a functional architecture. So how is this uh, achieved? So one way of doing that is the so-called bang-bang approach. This is a, a uh, sorry. <laughs> this is a term, bang-bang, uh, that is born from the engineering uh, field that is normally used to describe systems that change abruptly from one state to, to, to the other. And uh, if we apply this concept to morphogenesis, this would mean that organs first grow, they make all the single pieces, and only when they reach the correct size, they would switch to a organization uh, phase. While this is quite efficient from a theoretical point of view, it's actually an exception in biology. What we often see is um, an approach that I like to call the multitasking approach, in which growth and organization actually happening at the same time, and this means that proliferating, migrating, and differentiating cells, they all occupy the same space. So although this is quite a, like a hallmark of developing tissues, we don't really understand fully how, how the different processes are uh, coordinated and how the multitasking is, is actually achieved. Um, <clears throat> however, we do know some things. So the temporal coordination at the lineage level of the different behaviors has been widely studied. But uh, what we know much less about is actually the spatial coordination at the tissue level. And that's gonna be the focus of my, of my presentation. So I use the vertebrate retina as a model to study the logistics of organ development. And the retina is this thin neural tissue that lies on the back of our eyes that is quite powerful in the sense that it's able to extract rich sensory information for, from our environment. And to perform these functions, the retina requires a precise cellular um, architecture. The different neurons of the retina are distributed in three layers. At the apical layer, there are the photoreceptor neurons that collect the light. They transmit this information to the interneurons. They then relate to the projection neurons that connect the retina to, to the brain. This structure is highly conserved, present from zebrafish to humans. And I use the, the zebrafish as a main uh, model system in, in the lab to probe growth and organization because this system allows me to study these processes across scales, both at the tissue level, but also at the level of individual cells. Why are these processes happening in vivo? Because of the transparency and small size of the zebrafish. So how does the retina grow? So the retina starts as a pseudostratified epithelium in which progenitor cells, multiple than progenitor cells, are actually connected to both ends of the tissue. And these cells, they move their somal nuclei apically where they divide. And by doing so, they generate more, more cells driving the growth of the tissue. Eventually, these multiple than progenitors, they start to differentiate. So they make neurons that they also need to migrate. And these cells migrate actively through this crowded, crowded environment. And by doing so, they build the three different layers. But as I mentioned, all of this is happening at the same time, the growth and the organization. And I've been really interested in understanding how are these complex behaviors coordinated in, in space. <clears throat> to start, I focus my attention on the emergency of the apical layer of neurons, because this layer replaces the mitotic zone of the neuroepithelium. So we thought that this could be a good starting point to look at coordination. And the first question I asked was, do these cells even move because they are born in the apical surface and reside at the apical surface? So intuitively, one could think that they could simply stay there. However, when we looked at these cells live, we saw that they actually undergo substantial translocation across the entire thickness of the, of the neuroepithelium before returning to the apical surface where they will fully differentiate and perform their functions. So here you can see a representative trajectory 
However, we looked at like all the cells that we looked so far, they, they show the same trends in relocation. And this behavior was observed across the entire um, epithelium. Here you can see the cells in yellow moving back to the apical surface. And I hope you can appreciate that this is happening as the tissue undergoes substantial uh, growth. So we discovered that zebrafish and uh, photoreceptors in zebrafish undergo this stereotypic translocation. But is this a fish specific thing or a fundamental aspect of retinal formation? To ask, to ask this question, we collaborated with a tissue bank in the UK and we looked at photoreceptor position in human embryos. We saw that in younger retinas, photoreceptors are distributed along the apical basal axis. But in older regions, they are more restricted to the apical surface, which is consistent with the idea of migration. This motivated me to establish retinal organoids in the lab that I grow from human um, iPS cells. And also in the organoids, I observed that in early stages, the photoreceptors are again distributed along the apical basal axis, but they become more and more restricted to the apical surface as development progresses. So it recapitulates the primary tissue and, and we then could use this system to look at cell behavior live. And when we label the photoreceptor cells in the developing organoids, we could see that they also do uh, undergo a bidirectional translocation, very similar to what we had discovered in the zebrafish. When we put these trajectories side by side, there are differences which are expected because of the differences in thickness and developmental pace. However, we also notice similarities. So if we focus only in the shape of the trajectories, we can see that the basal movement is often more directed than the apical movement. This motivated us to ask, how do these cells actually move? And we went back to the zebrafish where we could do, uh, uh, we could look in more detail at the cytoskeletal machinery. And now I will just summarize some of our findings. So we discovered that during the basal movement, microtubules are important. And if we destabilize microtubules that we see in the apical attachment, these cells no longer move. However, when they turn back to the apical side, these stable microtubules are no, no longer present. What we see is the appearance of enrichments of actomycin at the cell rear. And if we interfere with the actomycin, these cells are no longer able to, to migrate. So we propose that photoreceptors use distinct cytoskeletal machineries to move in different directions. This knowledge also allowed us to interfere with the system and ask the question, which I think is the most interesting part of this uh, project. So why do the photoreceptors move in the first place? Why spend all this energy to return to the same spot? And to answer this question, we need to go back to the tissue. So I want to remind you that the retina is highly proliferative and all these cells here labeled in gray, they need to divide at the apical surface of the tissue. And if they, for, they are, if they are forced to divide away from that region, they tend to delaminate. So we reason that perhaps the photoreceptors, since they are born so early, that they need to move away to make space for the incoming divisions. To test that, we block now photoreceptor migration across the entire retina. So here you see in the control group, the photoreceptor cells are at where they should be in the basal positions, and the mitotic cells appear at their apical locations. However, when we block photoreceptor migration, now photoreceptors are all at the apical surface, and we start to see mitotic cells at subapical positions. This becomes even more clear when we looked at it live. So progenitor cells again in yellow. Photoreceptors appear directly at the apical surface because they cannot move in this condition and they stay there. The progenitor cells try to go up to divide, but there is not enough space. So they are forced to enter mitosis at subapical uh, positions where they should not be. So when we block photoreceptor migration, this congests the apical surface because they are already in enough number and size to do that. So that's why they need to move. When this, when the block in the in the presence of this blockage, we see the appearance of subapical divisions. These cells then delaminate. And they continue to divide even within neuronal layers where they should not be. And they also produce neurons, which themselves are also delaminated, so they don't have the proper connections. And in extreme cases, these neurons, because they are kind of lost in the tissue, they form another ectopic layer in the basal layer of the tissue where they should not be. 
highlighting the importance of these movements to really allow the progenitor cells to do their job and in that way prevent secondary lamination defects. So to summarize, I showed you that uh, photoreceptors undergo a bidirectional translocation that is very stereotypic. That happens not only in zebrafish, but also in human organoids. And our primary tissue data also supports that. I also summarized some of our findings showing that uh, these cells use distinct mechanisms to move in different directions. This is especially interesting because we know that neurons can change direction by changing polarity or mode of migration. Here's another way that they can achieve that. And more importantly, I told you that this is a, not a canonical type of migration in terms of when we think of neuronal migration, because it's not really necessary for the cells to get to the right position, right? If they would not migrate, they would still end up in, this, in the correct place where they should be in the future for when you think of function. Instead, this migration actually powers the, drives the like relocation of an entire cell population here labeled in blue, the photoreceptor cells, away from the mitotic zone of the tissue, allowing the tissue to grow and organize at the same, uh, at the same time. We think that this is an example of a single cell behavior that prevents spatial competition at the tissue level. And it also highlights that neuronal translocation can have functions beyond putting neurons in the, in the correct place. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the whole lab. So this work was developed in Karen Anders lab at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden initially, and now at the Gulbenkian Institute of Science here in, in Portugal. Uh, special thanks to Elisa and Jenny who worked with me uh, closely on this project. Uh, I would also like to thank all the facilities in both institutes and you for the attention. Thank you very much. Beautiful talk with lovely images. Um, please use the chat uh, Q and A box to ask any questions. And um, while people are thinking of questions to type in, I'll start off. Um, so, is this apical attachment that seems to carry on the whole way through the migration or translocation of the cell body necessary? If you sever that attachment, do the cells fail to either migrate basally or back up uh, apically? So, our experience suggests that it's not necessary. So mm -hmm. when, when the attachments are not there, the cells are still able to move. They turn, turn somehow a, a backup mode of, of migration. We have seen this in another cell type, but I have some preliminary data that suggests that this is also happening with these cells. So if the attachment is not there, they can do some sort of free migration that we don't fully understand yet, mm -hmm. but it's much more inefficient in terms of how fast they get to the right place and also how many times they make mistakes. So because... Sometimes they end up in the wrong place. They can form this extra layer that should not be there. So the attachment is important, but it's not like necessary in all in, in all cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'll ask a second question. So it's really interesting that these two, well, the behavior of one cell type is basically to accommodate for the behavior of a second cell type. Um, yeah. Do you have any idea about when these cell types evolved? Did the you know, did they evolve together or did one evolve first? And that's why they've adapted their behavior. Yeah, that's it's an interesting question. So in this case, the progenitor cells were always there, right? Even if you think of a very primary, like um, an ancestor, uh, ancestral retina, right? You always had a progenitor cell and you always had a, because the, the progenitor cell is the one that's going to form the tissue and you always had a photoreceptor cell because that, that was the first, like if you think of invertebrates also, this is kind of the ancestral type of cell. Like you have, mm -hmm. You, you can find still nowadays like animals that have a photoreceptor cell that is kind of multifunctional, that does the role of the photoreceptor, but also of the other cells. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have like an intermediate step where you only have the, you have the photoreceptor cell in just the projection neuron, but you don't have the interneuron. So we don't have many examples of how the evolution actually went, uh, mm -hmm. but that's like part of the hypothesis that initially you had like one cell type that did all the things. And then you had like a, a, a division of labor kind of with the evolution of, of, of new cell types. So one way to think about it is that the photoreceptor cell maybe was the, the only and the first cell to be born, but now as the tissue evolved, you need to add more cells. So the progenitor cells need to keep proliferating to produce all these other cell types. And then maybe in the ancestral retina, there was no need for movement, but that's as you start to make more building blocks and these building blocks were added later, then you needed to make or continue to prove or to protect that space where the progenitor cells need to divide. So, but that's like very 
a lot of speculation. Like uh, we don't, like, I ha don't think we have the models to test this. Okay, great. Very interesting. Thank you. So a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Vivian Valencia says, amazing work. Congratulations. Thank you. When you block the PR migration, are those PRs normal? Does, do they differentiate normally? Um, or could the migration actually be um, relevant for exposing the PRs to environmental cues to promote their differentiation or maturation? Yeah, so that's that's definitely an important question. Uh, our experience suggests that they are fine. Like when we looked at the markers and the morphology, so we have this transgenic line where we block the migration of all the cells and they mm -hmm. seem completely fine. Uh, we haven't done uh, yet any like... Um, like behavioral analysis or functional analysis to see, you know, how, if there is any functional impairment by just looking at morphology and position of the cells, it doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, thank you. Nicole Edwards asks, are there any congenital or developmental diseases associated with the failure of photoreceptors to migrate? Not, not to my knowledge. Also, because we didn't know that they migrated in the first place, so that's kind of the first uh, evidence that these cells are migrating. It would be really interesting to see. Um, there are definitely many neuronal uh, just migration disorders that affect the different parts of the brain. But even those, like, I, there are very few reports of like um, defects also in the retina in those patients. But I don't know if it's just because it has not been the focus of the studies or because the defects are not uh, are not really there. But those genes are definitely important for neuronal migration, like in many parts of the nervous system. So it's possible that a migration disorder that affects the brain might also affect cells in the retina. And it would be interesting to see if their like congenital defects could arise uh, in the retina. And I think one one like thought that I keep having is that sometimes the defect might not be directly because you know the neuron could not get to the right place but because of the secondary consequences of that neuron not migrating right there are types of uh, migration disorders called um, i think it's called neuronal heterotopia where the neurons stay at the ventricular zone in the cortex so where the progenitors divide so perhaps there also the problem is not because the neurons didn't get to the right place. It's because they are also interfering with the development, the overall development of the of the organ. So that's something that uh, yeah, to to keep in mind that the defects might not be known, might not be cell autonomous uh, every time. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question, but you've also got a couple more. So if you could answer those in the chat during the next talk, that would be great. So David Ossolan asks, do both rods and cones migrate? Cones are usually born before rods, at least in the mouse. Yeah, so we we actually didn't look carefully into the rods. So the, the zebrafish is like a cone-heavy um, uh, retina, like other diurnal um, animals, right? You have much more cones, and they come up much um, earlier. And I think that's why the reason why they need to migrate. Uh, what I can say is that even for the cones, like if you look at the cells that are born later, they their migration is much more shallow compared to the cells that move earlier. So I would intuitively think that the rods don't need to migrate so much, but we haven't done these experiments. Great, thank you.